Hi and welcome to our Ancient Wisdom series. I'm Mike Hancock. And in the first of this series, I want to trace us right back here to Luxor in Egypt. And we're going to tell a story about the connection between ancient Egypt, the Templar Knights, and that secret sect of the Freemasons that everybody wonders about today. So the year is 1573 BC, and there's a king, the king of Upper Egypt. At that stage, there were two kings in Egypt, one of Upper Egypt, which was in Luxor or Thebes at the time, and the second one in Cairo or Memphis, which was Lower Egypt. The Lower Egypt king was actually not from Egypt. He was Sumerian. They had taken over Lower Egypt and his name was Aphosis. And the Upper Egyptian king was Sequenyanatau. And Sequenyanatau, whose actual mummy was found buried underneath the tomb of Ramses II, right back in 1873, in fact, Sequenyanatau was captured by the Sumerians and actually held in the city of Thebes at that time. And what they called the kings is they called the kings the pillars of the upper Nile and of the lower Nile. And later on, they became pharaohs, but none of the pharaohs were actually Egyptian. Pharaohs like Cleopatra were a Ptolemy and they were Greek. So back to our story, back to 1573 BC. So Sequenyanatau is a king who is in a line of kings that understands the king-making secret. When a king became king, what happened was that the high priest had one part of the king-making secret and the other part was passed through the lineage of the pharaoh. And that secret was things like certain herbs and, and um, oils that needed to be anointed at the time, certain chants and sounds that needed to be done, prayers, uh, mantras, if you like, and really understanding some of the things about the greater universe. Call it an initiation for a king. Aphosis, who is the king right down here in Memphis, the Sumerian king, and his group had invaded right away from Sumeria, which is modern day Iraq, into Egypt. He wanted that secret. So he sent three criminals, led by a guy called Jubello, to basically rough up Sequenyanatau at his time of prayer, which was when the sun was going down in the evening and he'd go out to the bank of the Nile, looking over his palace and he'd pray to the sun god Ra, Amun Ra. And these three criminals bribed essentially one of the high priests to come into Sequenyanatau's set up into the palace there and then go over to the Nile and rough him up and get this part of the king-making secret so Aphosis could have it, so he would truly be the king of all Egypt and he'd be initiated in the way of the old kings and nobody could stand before him. Unfortunately, things got a little out of hand. Sequenia and Atau saying, no, you guys, it's not happening. I'm not giving away my stuff. And so they beat him up. And in fact, they hit him in the head with probably what was a club or a mace at the time and unfortunately killed him. So at that point there, the king making secret and everything that was part of it had essentially died. But of course, this stuff's never dead because the high priest has much of it as well. And at that time, it goes into a little bit of hiding. So I want to just tell you one or two things about the king making secrets. They knew things like, and when the, the Book of the Dead was found um, in Egypt at the Temple of Saqqara, they found things like that once the Pharaoh had died, once the king had died, he went into the cave of Sobek, the crocodile god. And he went into that cave for the 12 hours of the duet, which is duality, the good and the bad. So you see pictures and images of the Pharaoh being eaten by crocodiles and then there's beautiful women offering him fruit at the next stop. And he goes through this river journey in this cave. And when he comes out of there, he comes to this wonderful place, which was called Merida and Marika, sorry. And when he comes to Marika, it's on something called the 33rd parallel. And this is the blessed place. We would call it heaven. But in fact, when Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, what he did is he took the concepts of um, the 12 hours of the duet and going through that journey on the road, um, the, the river and coming out to the other side to this beautiful place. And he made it the elves journey when they left Middle Earth. So here we have the king of the Upper Nile, the pillar of the Upper Nile destroyed. Aphosis does not have the information he needs. And 
basically everything is lost. Although there were people that knew about it. And one of those people that had this information and took it to Israel with him was Moses. Now we're not going to get into the story of Moses today, but that secret went to Israel and became shared with somebody called King David. And King David had a lot of that secret and he built a temple there in Jerusalem. And then his son built a bigger temple. His son was named Solomon. And we've all heard the realms and wishes of Solomon's temple. We'll be back in a little minute to discover a little bit more about what happened next. We don't do travel. We do profound life experiences. Welcome to Soul Journeys Travel. For more than 10 years, we have led groups of conscious individuals to some of the most exotic ancient sites on Earth. Machu Picchu and Incan empires, Egyptian gods in the pyramids, Mayan prophecies, Viking adventures, on the Trail of the Templars, and even Asia's first spiritual cruise are just some of the spectacular individually crafted tours run here at Soul Journeys. Not only will you experience ancient wonders and sights your eyes have waited a lifetime for, our leaders will help you experience sacred circles, past life experiences, inner journeys, and de-engineering of your human programs that will assist you in overcoming undercurrents and blind spots that have held you back in your life. You will experience a deep and true wisdom, and at Soul Journeys, we share the alternative archaeology and research completed by our leaders that will help you understand that much of what you have learned and have been conditioned with is a lie, allowing you to make better and more informed personal decisions in your life from then on. Some of our clients have done up to eight journeys with us. Why, you may ask? Because at Soul Journeys, we design personal and intimate journeys for your soul to magical ancient sites around the world, coupled with brilliant leadership, wisdom, and coaching. Join us and have a profound life experience. Go to www.rockyourlife.net and click on Soul Journeys. We're back with our Ancient Wisdom series, talking about the relationship between Egypt, the Pharaohs, the Templar Knights, and modern day Freemasonry. Now, the last king of Egypt at that time, Sequenia Natau, is dead, so the dynasties have to change. And that's another story entirely. And in fact, if you've ever heard that statement, the king is dead, long live the king, it's not British from the medieval times, it's Egyptian from when Egypt was, was in its most powerful grace. So let's fast track now to 1119 AD. And from a place near Champaign in France, uh, a young knight by the name of Hughes de Pions with his assistant Geoffrey de Chauncey um, got a group together of nine knights funded by the church at that time to go to Jerusalem on a crusade, the first of the crusades in many respect. Although their mission was not to um, open the way for pilgrims or do anything like that, theirs was a mission based on a very, very ancient rumor that had gone through the church. Now, why had that rumor gone through the church? The reason why is because even when you uh, look at the cross, for instance, the cross itself from a biblical perspective is where Jesus was um, crucified. But from an Egyptian perspective, the cross was the bottom part of the Ankh, the key of life, which actually meant savior in Egyptian. So a lot of these links happen through time. Now, a lot of this information that was taken by Moses and others through to King David and Solomon, Solomon had buried underneath his temple. So the knights, the Templar knights in 1119 AD, led by Hughes de Pions, went on this mission to Jerusalem to look under Solomon's temple. So here they were. And they bartered their way in and they got essentially a contract to go and do a fundamental and rudimentary form of archaeology, if you like, under Solomon's temple. And they stayed there for nine years. And the funny thing about that is that there's so much documented history now from those times and such important discoveries. Nothing of this is documented except that they were there and they left. And that's documented more in the Arabic texts and in the Jewish texts rather than in any texts that relate to the church. So then Hughes de Pions and his knights returned to France and 
There's many, many mysteries as to what they came back with. Some people say they had the Holy Grail. Some people say they had the Ark of the Covenant. Some people say they had the shroud that covered Jesus' face and the lance and, and all of those sort of things. And that may or may not be true. Well, one thing's for sure is that they uncovered some amazing and incredible secrets and amazing and incredible wisdom. Prior to that time, builders around the world had struggled to build structures, anything like the palaces of Egypt or anything like the, um, the pyramids or, or that sort of thing. But suddenly, all throughout France and then throughout the greater European world, amazing churches like the Chartres Cathedral popped up, which is a Templar cathedral. If you go to Glasgow in Scotland, you'll see the Glasgow Cathedral. It's also a Templar cathedral. And over the next 189 years after Hughes de Payans and his group got together and found whatever they found underneath the Temple of Solomon, um, which these days, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, is actually where it's situated is now called the Temple Mount, uh, not far from the Wailing Wall. And it's a place that is incredibly sacred to the Muslim culture these days. And it's a place that very few people are actually allowed into. Um, although there have been documentaries made underneath the catacombs, underneath the Temple Mount and different things that they've found there, different sects that has um, come in there, including the Freemasons themselves over time. So the 189 years, the Templars in France build the most significant empire of any empire that's been built on earth. They become the wealthiest. They become the protectors of the pilgrims going to Jerusalem. They become um, adapted to England, Scotland, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Germany, Italy, and have bases in places like Cyprus and Syria and France and all throughout that region, the Mediterranean region there. They even invent the banking system that we know today and they invent the credit card. So the folks, if you think the credit card is only 30 or 40 years old, that's not true. The credit card goes right back to the 12th century. Now it wasn't a little plastic card with your name embossed on it, but it was a letter of credit. So you would go and bank your money with the Templar Knights. You'd bank your gold there. You'd be given this letter and these seals. And as you went on your journey to the Holy Land to do your own pilgrimage, what you would find along the way is Templar safe houses and, and safe inns and places to stay. Instead of carrying money, you would simply use this letter of credit and the exchange would go back and that would be debited from your gold. So where did they keep this gold as a little aside? Well, have you ever eaten Rockford cheese? That beautiful blue cheese. Rockford is a place in Provence and it's a place that I visited some years ago with a group of ours that we put together on the Trail of the Templar Knights. And it's an 11 story cheese making building, not dissimilar in style to what you see around you right here on screen, 11 stories deep. Now here's the thing, when we took our group there, in 2013. What actually happened was our group was going, why isn't there any cheese here? And there was very little cheese. Now, admittedly, it was off season a little bit, but you've got 11 stories and places to store cheese, but there's almost no cheese. So we asked them the question. So now today in the modern world of 7 billion people and people enjoy blue cheese and Rockford is known all around the world as the cheese that has, um, you know, some of the oldest heritage. Why can't you buy that cheese today? Or why can't you get that cheese at Rockford? The fact of the matter is not much of it is actually sold because um, there's only sold to demand. So how much demand was there in the 12th century? The answer is a lot less because you're only servicing 30, 40, 50,000 people instead of 7 billion people. That Fort of Rock was the place where all of the gold was stored under a mountain 11 stories down. When we come back, we're going to share more about what happened to the Templar Knights and then what the morph was that turned it to modern Freemasonry and uncover some of the myths that you may have and you may not know and understand about Freemasonry. We'll see you soon. We don't do travel. We do profound life experiences. Welcome to Soul Journeys Travel. 
For more than 10 years, we have led groups of conscious individuals to some of the most exotic ancient sites on Earth. Machu Picchu and Incan empires, Egyptian gods in the pyramids, Mayan prophecies, Viking adventures, on the Trail of the Templars, and even Asia's first spiritual cruise are just some of the spectacular individually crafted tours run here at Soul Journeys. Not only will you experience ancient wonders and sites your eyes have waited a lifetime for, our leaders will help you experience sacred circles, past life experiences, inner journeys, and de-engineering of your human programs that will assist you in overcoming undercurrents and blind spots that have held you back in your life. You will experience a deep and true wisdom, and at Soul Journeys, we share the alternative archaeology and research completed by our leaders that will help you understand that much of what you have learned and have been conditioned with is a lie, allowing you to make better and more informed personal decisions in your life from then on. Some of our clients have done up to eight journeys with us. Why, you may ask? Because at Soul Journeys, we design personal and intimate journeys for your soul to magical ancient sites around the world, coupled with brilliant leadership, wisdom, and coaching. Join us and have a profound life experience. Go to www.rockyourlife.net and click on Soul Journeys. Hi there and welcome back to our Ancient Wisdom series. And let's move forward to a very auspicious day. Let's call it tall poppy syndrome. Friday the 13th of October 1307. And at that stage in France, France was ruled by a guy called King Philip the Fair. He didn't seem that fair to me. And he was very much in cahoots with um, the Pope at the time, Pope Clementine. And what they decided to do, they said, these Templars have just got far too much wealth, far too much control. They were bankrolling the King of France at that stage in his wars and what he wanted to do. So what they decided to do is they decided that they would send out a an army on one night and capture all the Templars, take all of their wealth and find out how they did all of this stuff. So out they go and they round up all the Templars on Friday the 13th, which is why we have Black Friday, which is why the number 13 is unlucky. 13 is not unlucky. If we go right back to Egypt, 13 was the lucky number in Egypt. 13 and 20 became the divine numbers, the 13th moon and all of that sort of thing. Back to 1307. So the Templars were rounded up. But just like when you try and do anything, just like when Hitler tried to round up the Jews or Pol Pot tried to destroy the whole of his race in Cambodia, you never get everybody. So who didn't they get? Well, all of the Templars living along the coast got tipped off and the Templar ships sailed. Over 40 of the ships sailed out of a harbour just on the, on the French-Spanish border there. I should say the French-Portuguese border around that area. And what they did is that they read, had read and understood the ancient scrolls, which was saying to go and sail the 42nd parallel, which they did. And they just kept sailing and they came to a land which they knew of from Egypt called Marika. They called it Amerika, America. And they landed in a harbour in Massachusetts, just near Boston. And even today, if you go there, you'll see the remnants of a Templar fort um, at Newport. And you'll see uh, rocks carved with uh, writing there. And you'll also find a couple of rune stones left by the Templars. And also, if you look at the ancient Indian mythology from the area there, they talk about white men coming to America. So this was right back in 1307 which was 180 something years, 185 years before Columbus was meant to have uh, discovered America. So what did the Templars do? Firstly, um, the ones that were rounded up, led by their Grand Master Jacques Molay, never gave up the secrets. And I, my personal belief is having visited um, the place where Jacques Molay was martyred seven years later, right in front of Notre Dame Cathedral, where he was slow roasted at the stake, which is something that I certainly don't want to go through, but I had a profound experience when I was there. I believe they didn't give up the secrets. In fact, Jacques Molay's last words were, to the king and to the pope, you'll both be dead inside of a year. The king actually died very soon afterwards, and the pope died not long after that, so his prophecy came correct. 
So the, the Templars hid essentially in America for seven years. And then they decided that they would come back to uh, come back to Europe, but they didn't want to go back to France because of all the problems there with the church and everything. So they decided that they would sail to Scotland. Why Scotland? Because Scotland was under the rule of Robert the Bruce and the Celtic Church. And the Celtic Church did not recognize the Church of Rome. So therefore it had no connections. So the Templars came to, to Scotland at a very auspicious time because it was at the time, if you've ever watched Braveheart, it was at the time that the English were trying to take Scotland. Why did they want Scotland? Scotland had all the wealth and the English king had spent all of his money. He was in debt and he had wars to fight. So they went up to Scotland to Stirling, just outside Stirling, which is not far from Edinburgh, 25 kilometers from my memory. And they went to a place called Bannockburn. And the Scottish were basically farmers children, women, they had pikes, they had rakes, they didn't really have any weapons. So the English just thought this was going to be a total bath. And as they came through the burn on the 25th of June, 1314, coming out from the woods on the side of the burn were these knights wearing white with the red cross. And as soon as the English saw it, they panicked. Now there weren't many Templars from record, maybe only 30 or 40 that actually were there. But the sight of those knights put panic through the English and they turned and they started running. And of course they got caught in the burn. And at that stage, all of the, the Scottish people armed with whatever they could have, children, women, rakes, clubs, anything, just chase the English. They annihilated the English on that battlefield and they chased them basically back to the border. And that was the day that Scotland won forever its independence from the UK. So what did the Templars do? Firstly, they couldn't be Templars anymore because they would be chased. So they settled down, took off their knightly armor, got rid of the red crosses and the white, and they integrated in Scottish society. And if we move forward to now 1470, a church was built. It was a chapel actually called the Roslyn Chapel. It's at um, Stirling, which is right near where the Battle of Bannockburn happened um, all those years before in 1314. And if you go to the Roslyn Chapel, you will see that it's a chapel like no other chapel. It has the most amazing sacred geometry. It has symbols for music carved into the pillars and into the edifices there. And there's actually, which you can Google by the way, there's actually a song that the Roslyn Chapel plays, which is this most stunning medieval song, which is a song that's been passed down. William St. Clair, Sinclair, which came from the name Saint Clair, which was the French derivative of that. William St. Clair built the Roslyn Chapel. And in the chapel, there are two pillars. In Freemasonry, those two pillars are called um, Joachim and Boaz. Those two pillars, when you go there, are carved with aloe vera and corn. They're foods found in America, but America hadn't been discovered. So why were they carved on a chapel that was completed 20 years before Columbus found America? There's many mysteries around the Roslyn Chapel. One, it doesn't have an altar. Two, it's built to the exact dimensions as Herod's temple, the temple of Jerusalem, which is Solomon's temple, the exact dimensions. Three, it has underground crypts that have been not opened in the modern age. And there's a whole thing around that with the trusts because the people who own Roslyn Chapel and who caretake it in trust are still direct descendants from the St. Clair family. It's a stunning piece of architecture. None of the kings of England ever sacked the Roslyn Chapel when they went into Scotland and fought. Oliver Cromwell, who destroyed everything, did not destroy the Roslyn Chapel and he was a Freemason. So the Templar Knights turned into Freemasonry and that's why the first lodge of Freemasonry sits in George Street in Scotland, in Edinburgh, not far from Stirling. And that's why, where Freemasonry started discerning itself around the world. So why is this important and what's it got to do today? Well, let's finish off with this. The founding fathers of American, 
Many of them were Freemasons. George Washington himself was a Freemason. If you go to the Freemason Lodge in George Street in Edinburgh, you will see clearly above the fireplace in the most prominent place there, a picture of George Washington. You see, America wanted to be the Egypt of the modern times. They wanted to take the king-making secrets right back from Sequenia to Tao's time and many thousands of years before that and build America with those values in mind. And that's why Washington DC has the obelisk in there and that's why it has the sacred geometry and it's set out on a pentacle and many other things from ancient Egypt design. But also Washington and the founding fathers took the two pillars and they wove the River Nile amongst them and they created the dollar sign to create wealth. To make America the most wealthy country and the, the most advanced country since Egypt. So who are the Freemasons today? Are they a secret society? Of course they are. They have their secrets. And why should they not? Anything that you go and study, just like watching this series here, you are going to learn secrets and in-depth knowledge because you have taken the time to do it. Are there certain sects of people that within the Freemasons that are not good? The Illuminati or the 33rd degree? Well, firstly, the different degrees of Freemasonry is something again for another time, except for the 33rd. The highest degree of Freemasonry finally tells you the secret. And the secret of Freemasonry, folks, and its relationship right back to Egypt is this. The secret is that there is no secret. I'm Mike Hancock, and I'll see you on our next series.